Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. On behalf of the Lower Marion Historical Society, I welcome you to tonight's presentation titled To Be of Use Somewhere in France, the Women's Club of Balakinwood during the First World War. My name is Erin Betley, Vice President of the Society. Our mission is to preserve and share the rich history of Lower Marion and Narberth. We strive to broaden the kinds of stories we tell and engage our community in the process. And so tonight, during Women's History Month, we have an opportunity to learn some untold stories of contributions made by women in Lower Marion over a century ago through the records of the Women's Club of Balakinwood that date back to its founding by nine women in 1912. In a moment, I'll introduce our speaker, Bria Scarlett. But before I do, I wanted to let you know that our purpose for this presentation is to launch a paper that Bria researched and wrote for us as part of her internship with us last summer. This document is available for download on our website, lowermarianhistory.org. Through their generations of inspiring work, the Women's Club has maintained an archive that is a treasure trove of information about so many aspects of Lower Marion's history. I first became aware of these archives several years ago while I was doing a historical research project about a family of remarkable women in Philadelphia and later Bella Kinwood who were national figures in women's rights and suffrage in the early 1900s, and they were honorary members of the club. I visited the archives in the club's headquarters in the Levering Mill Tribute House in Bella Kinwood, and I have to say that holding these records in my hands was a truly moving experience because you could see the details of the behind the scenes work of these women and how they worked to establish a free public library and what it took to organize efforts to support soldiers and refugees, to create a school lunch program, to support pro playgrounds and to fight for the woman's right to vote. The archives also gave us insight into how these women organized with other women's clubs for example, through the State Federation of Pennsylvania Club Women and the Montgomery County Federation of Women's Clubs. How they fundraised and organized to build their own clubhouse. This is the Levering Mill Tribute House. And right next door to that, the Balakinwood Memorial Library, built in memory of those who served in World War I. And then decade after decade, the club continued its civic work up until the present. This past summer, the Lower Marion Historical Society hosted several interns working on research projects. And we had the opportunity to inventory the records held at the Levering Mill Tribute House. So on a warm, lovely day, Bria and I were joined by several interns from the Lower Marion High School for our first look at these records together. And it was a delightful experience to see the value of these records through the eyes of our interns. And then Bria designed the scope of her research project and spent her summer deep in the archives and in other historical material to contextualize her findings. And I'm so delighted that she will share the results of this work with us tonight. So it is my pleasure to introduce Bria Scarlett. She currently attends the Honors College at the University of Delaware, majoring in international relations, environmental studies, and history. She is also a graduate of Marion Mercy Academy right here in Lower Marion. As a student of history, Bria has always been fascinated with the untold stories of the past. Her summer internship project with the Lower Marion Historical Society focuses on highlighting the forgotten stories of Lower Marion women during World War I. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, like Erin said, my name is Bria Scarlett, and I was a summer intern for the Lower Mary Historical Society last summer. Um, during my time as an intern, I had the great opportunity to work with the records from the Women's Club of Bella Kenwood um, as they were in the process of going through their record collections. Um, like Erin said, my project is entitled To Be of Use Summer in France, the Women's Club of Bella Kenwood uh, during the First World War, and it focuses on, as you can probably imagine, the Women's Club of Bella Kenwood. Um, and its early years and the work that it did to contribute to the war effort. Um, I also have my University of Delaware email on the first slide here. If anyone would like to reach out with questions or comments following the presentation. Um, this is my first time doing this kind of um, research presentation outside of the academic classroom. 
Uh, so I greatly appreciate you all being here uh, for that. Uh, so here's an end of, uh, overview of what I will be talking about tonight, just so that everyone knows what they're getting into. Um, so I will begin by talking about the inspiration for the project, um, and then I will also give you a short background on the Women's Club of Bala Kenwood in order to set the stage um, for some of the short stories that I will be sharing with you, uh, which focus on specific as aspects of the club's war work. Um, so we're going to start with um, the club's work in collaboration with the YWCA um, and the Red Cross. And then we'll move on to a very interesting story of how the Women's Club of Ballet Kenwood hosted a dinner party for American sailors. We'll also talk about the club and their sponsoring of European children that were orphaned during the war. Um, moving on, we'll talk about a donation the club made to the Baltimore Hospital for Blinded Soldiers and where those funds came from. And then lastly, lastly we'll talk about Liberty Bonds um, and the role of women overseas volunteers, particularly highlighting the role of one member's dedication, Mrs. Dorothea Fox. Um, so, like I stated, I worked with the records from the Women's Club, um, and all of the records were found in trunks in the Levering Mill Tribute House on Bella Avenue. Um, so when we first arrived, we were greeted with four large trunks of records pertaining to the club. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, um, the trunks were filled with binders and folders. I will say they were conveniently labeled with years. Um, but in those folders, we found meeting minutes, we had budgets, event programs, blueprints, um, newspaper clippings and many other documents um, pertaining to the club. Um, so most of what I looked at were um, meeting minutes, budgets, and event programs. Because we had so many records, um, I decided to narrow down the scope of my research just to the early years of the club um, and its records during World War I and the years right after World War I. I wanted to focus on the Women's Club of Alec Hinwood because oftentimes during the presentation of American war history, the role of women um, is oftentimes ignored, despite the fact that they performed critical work that allowed the US and its allies to win um, the wars it was a part of. I also think it's important to connect local stories to the larger historical narrative. That way, the national history is not an abstract idea, um, but it's something that people can have a direct connection to. Um, in other words, I feel like local stories make history feel much more real in a way. Um, so, Moving on to a general history of the Women's Club of Bala Kenwood. It was founded on May 12, 1912. Um, like Aaron said, it was founded by nine Lower Marion women. Uh, the first president of the club was Mrs. Edna Beck. In the records, her name is Leonidas Beck, but I made sure to put her first name because I think it's good to, we have to recognize the, the women and the role that they contributed as an individual. Um, many of the club's early meetings were held in local church lecture rooms. Um, and according to a 1990 pamphlet that I found from the Women's Club, uh, the club was founded to, quote, create a center of thought and action for civic betterment, for social progress, and for the highest and best in literature, music, and art. So the Women's Club of Ballack Henwood really solidified its commitment to social service and political awareness uh, during its early years. Only two years into the club's existence did World War I break out in Europe, and even though the U.S. did not join the war until 1917, the club still offered lots of support to Allied power, powers in Europe. Um, so from the beginning of the club's existence, women focused on social issues central to American and world politics, such as women's suffrage, women's rights, child labor laws, um, housing laws, uh, prohibition, and many other topics. Um, during the meetings, usually, the way that the um, meetings were structured, they would read essays uh, that were um, uh, that covered uh, the topics I mentioned before. Um, they would also write letters to local politicians. Um, sometimes they would have outside experts come in and give talks based off of the subject for that meeting, uh, that month's meeting. The picture that you see on the right is a picture of one of um, the meeting minutes uh, where the secretary describes the run of show for that day, essentially. Um, and I think it gives a good overview of what a traditional Women's Club of Alec Henwood meeting was like. Uh, so just to give you a little idea, I'll read a little bit of what they did that day. Um, so they began this meeting in particular with reading or with singing some French patriotic songs. Um, and then the suffrage department, which in this case was also combined with the legislative committee, uh, read some of the following papers, which are very interesting. Um, so they had a paper on prohibition, uh, they had a paper on safeguarding the labor and women, um, the labor of women and children in wartimes. Uh, 
safeguarding the morals of young girls and soldiers during war times, which I thought was funny, um, and securing protection against wartime profiteering, and then finally, the political status of women throughout the world. So clearly this club valued being active participants in rural politics and sought to promote and emphasize the role of women in various aspects of society. And I think when people hear the term women's club, they might have a preconceived notion of women just sitting around drinking tea and knitting. Um, and while I'm sure that there probably was some tea drinking and knitting going on, the Women's Club of Ballot Kenwood really was committed to being a politically and socially active organization. So we're gonna start getting into some of the stories now um, and some of the concrete ways that the members uh, contributed to the war effort. So as most people know, the American Red Cross, um, it was an organization founded in 1881. Um, and it was one of the main international organizations which helped to supply soldiers in World War I with medical supplies, food, clothing, and other necessities. Um, while the Red Cross was an active participant um, in supplying soldiers since the outbreak of war, once the US joined the conflict, the organization expanded their operations. And this included recruiting women on the home front. So the Women's Club of Balakinwood formed their own Red Cross committee uh, for the purposes of organizing the amount of donations the club will contribute over the years um, to the organization. And they contributed a lot. Um, and this committee uh, was led by Mrs. Stella Gardner. And you'll see her name a lot throughout the presentation. She was one of the more active members of the club. Um, and through this committee, uh, during World War I, the club donated a total of $967. Um, or $17,915 in 2023 dollars um, to the Red Cross. So it's a, a substantial donation. Um, as you can see uh, from one of the meeting minutes on the right-hand side of the screen, the club would also donate uh, large numbers of surgical dressings to the Red Cross. Uh, usually they would donate around 2,000 a month. Um, in this case, in the month of November, um, they donated 2,056 surgical dressings. Um, as I was preparing for this presentation, actually, I went to look up how one would go about making a surgical dressing in 1917. And to my surprise, I actually was able to find a pamphlet on eBay for some reason uh, that would that was um, actually published by the, the Red Cross in 1917. And it was a manual about how to how an individual could make you know surgical dressings. So if anybody wants to get into the practice of doing that, the information is out there. Um, so you can you can look into that. But going back onto topic. Um, finally, the picture on the bottom right of the screen is a screenshot um, from the Red Cross's report um, in 1919, summarizing the contributions the Red Cross organization made in the last year and a half of the war. So you can see the first, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the first entry right there um, is surgical dressings. And you can see that a total of 306,966,759 surgical dressings were made. And I think that it's important to have national reports to compare um, to the individual work of, in this case, the Women's Club of Ballot Kenwood. And it just puts into perspective the immense operation that it was to supply resources for the war. And it makes you consider just how many people, and in particular women, were dedicated large amounts of their time for years uh, to supplying armies abroad. This wasn't something they did one time. Consistently every month, the Women's Club of Ballot Kenwood was donating 2,000 uh, surgical dressings to the Red Cross. Um, so moving on to one of my more favorite stories uh, that I found while going through the records, and I'm not just saying that because Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, um, but because it has a really um, interesting connection to uh, a more well-known uh, event in U.S. history. Um, so in 1917, the, World, the Women's Club uh, held a Thanksgiving dinner for uh, some American sailors. And it turns out that these sailors were stationed on board the USS Oklahoma. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you've heard that ship's name in connection with another major um, event in US history, specifically Pearl Harbor and World War II. Um, that was one of the ships sunk um, at Pearl Harbor. But the USS Oklahoma story actually starts in World War I. So the ship was commissioned in 1916 and was used for the first time during the Great War. In World War I, um, the boat was used to convoy Allied ships through international waters uh, for the purposes of protecting them from uh, German U-boats. Uh, the dinner that the Women's Club held for these sailors was actually proposed by another important female leader of the time, Mrs. Hannah Shaw. Uh, 
Uh, she was a prominent leader of the National Congress of Mothers, which focused on children's education, juvenile um, court system reform, and other uh, social issues relating to the family and women. And Mrs. Hannah Schaff was actually an Upper Darby, uh, Upper Darby native, so another local connection here. Um, and Mrs. Schaff wrote to the Women's Club of Balakinwood to encourage them to host a dinner party. Um, and the club dutifully voted to do so. Um, and we can see here on the right some of the entries which describe the organization of the, the event um, and the sailors' gratitude afterwards. So on the right-hand side at the top, uh, it says a motion was moved by Mrs. Dorothea Walter Fox that a supper be given for sailors at Thanksgiving time. The details to be left to the committee. It was so voted. And then afterwards, they created a committee, um, organized the event. Um, and I'm pretty sure it went really well because um, after uh, Mrs. Stella Edner Gardner uh, read a letter of appreciation from the crew and officers of the Oklahoma of the club's recent hosp hospitality. So that's one of my favorite stories that I um, learned. Another interesting tidbit relating uh, to the way that the women supported bowls abroad is found in the entries which mention how the club sponsored orphaned and struggling children in Europe. So of course, with any war past or present comes the suffering of innocent civilians and the most innocent of which are the children. In the case of World War One, the Red Cross's report uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, specifically talks about Romanian children, but of course mentions French and Belgian um, orphans as well. I specifically mention Romania though, because the club was made aware of the needs of this demographic by the Overseas Committee of Emergency Aid of Pennsylvania. Um, and they made a point to um, donate to the Romanian children uh, in need. In answering the Red Cross's call uh, for aid, um, the club decided to sponsor two French children. The way that they did this, uh, the main members of the club sponsored one child and then the daughters of the members sponsored another. But in total, two um, children were sponsored. Um, they would send funds and then the supplies needed uh, to the children abroad. There wasn't much more about this um, in the records I had access to, but I thought it was important to mention how those suffering in Europe were able to find support from local communities in the US. So the next two slides focus on the interesting topic of the YWCA. Um, the well-known YWCA played an important role just like the Red Cross in facilitating war work among women. The YWCA uh, was an international organization founded in 1855 and its American subset was founded just a few years later I believe around 1858. Um, the um, YWCA during the First World War was a segregated organization that while advocating for peace abroad, did continue to perpetuate harmful uh, racial prejudices at home. Uh, one woman who sought to end the racial segregation in the YWCA was Miss Eva Bowles. She advocated in particular for the white women in the organization to support the demands of their black colleagues uh, such as labor and union rights, and in general, um, equal treatment in the workplace. During this time, due to Eva Bowles and other Black women in the YWCA, the organization did begin to expand some of its operations into Black communities. These expansions were, of course, needed to be funded, and these um, expansions were funded by the larger YWCA um, organization. Now, while not certain, perhaps the Women's Club of Balakinwood was aware of the calls for an equal and unsegreg unsegregated YWCA um, and supported the initiative through some donations of funding. Um, and I say that because of the image on the right. The image on the right reads, um, our president in this connection emphasized the fact that the money from the drive is to be used for war relief work among all races and creeds, not just for regular YWCA work. So while not a definitive, while not definitive evidence that the women's club supported the work of Eva Bowles, it does show that the club was aware that the YWCA was using funds to support their operations and services, um, or um, they were supportive of the expansion of the YWCA operations and services to um, people who were not previously focused on by the organization. So another hallmark of YWCA work during World War I uh, was known as Americanization work. Americanization work was basically helping refugees um, assimilate into American culture. And if done properly, this Americanization work had the potential to help immigrants and refugees establish themselves in the US. But in some cases, there were um, 
uh, problems with immigrants having to um, deny their native identity. But in general, it was a, a, a movement to help refugees from Europe come in um, and assimilate into US culture due to the war. Um, for, um, excuse me. So we see here that the Women's Club of Bala Kinwood did specifically support this work of the YWCA um, and their work with refugees. So we have a reading a entry here and it reads, Mrs. Hamilton moved and it was really carried that at the recommendation of the board, we as a club contribute $50 to the YWCA suggesting that this money be used for Americanization work if possible. So moving on to another significant moment in the club's participation in the war work movement. Uh, following the war, many soldiers returned uh, back to their home countries, injured, blinded, or handicapped. Um, in particular, the use of mustard gas resulted in many soldiers returning home blind. In Baltimore, there is actually a hospital for blinded soldiers, which the Women's Club of Ballot Kenwood uh, chose to support around the end of 1919. Their fundraiser resulted in them raising $633.45 in their money and $11,953 um, and some change in 2023 um, money. As you can probably read though from the, the image on the slide, the money did come from a questionable source. So where did this money come from? The money came from a plantation medley show that the club held February 12, 1919. The medley was organized by the music department of the club and was a large event for the club and the community. As you can see on the right, they created a pamphlet which included characters with their actresses, uh, musical pieces, and of course, lots of advertisements from local businesses to help raise funds. Now, I found this pamphlet before I really started digging into the early years of the club. So I had this pamphlet without any context. Um, and after digging through the records, I was able to find out a little bit more information about the organization of the event how much money they raised and what the money was used for. That being said, even with the context, this probably represents one of the more objectionable parts of the early years of Women's Club. Of course, um, in this case, Women's Club of Alton would uh, used the suffering and history of African-Americans as a way to raise money. And this medley shows that as much as people viewed the early 20th, 20th century as a relatively progressive era in American history, the wealthy classes especially still hold, held strong to their prejudice practices. What's especially interesting to me um, about this is that the Women's Club of Bala Kenwood was fairly progressive in most other aspects of American society. Uh, they were uh, strong supporters of labor laws, of fair housing for city workers, uh, women's rights, um, women's suffrage, and refugee um, um, aid. But in this case, they did continue to perpetuate um, century old, uh, centuries old racist notions of African-Americans. And the plantation medley highlights how in general, um, wealthy social groups used black culture and history uh, specifically to their advantage while simultaneously excluding them from their social spheres. Um, so the picture on the right is the first page of the plantation medley uh, pamphlet. Um, and the only thing I wanna point out here is the, the play on words right under plantation medley. Um, I'm not gonna repeat it, but it's there and then also on the second image down on the left-hand side, you can see the same play on words. So following uh, the plantation medley, um, another thing I wanted to talk about were liberty bonds. So one of the things that people most associate with women and World War I are liberty bonds. And essentially they were a way for the government to finance the large cost of the war. The program was organized by the Federal Reserve and there are four of these liberty loan drives. The lowest denomination of traditional liberty bonds that a person could buy uh, was $50. And the Federal Reserve targeted this program towards affluent women um, and used women's groups to promote the program across America. The Women's Club of Bala Kenwood throughout the war bought many liberty bonds. Um, I would find entries that would include updates here and there about, we bought $50 of liberty bonds, we bought $100 of liberty bonds. Um, and they would just add up. In the pamphlet that I found uh, from 1990, it mentioned that the club bought $1,000 worth of Liberty Bonds. But as I was going through the, the records, um, I didn't do the complete math, but uh, because I, I wasn't sure how many times they, they bought loans, but 
from what I can tell, they probably bought more than $1,000 worth of Liberty Bonds. I'm not exactly sure where that number came from, but they would they would buy Liberty Bonds almost every meeting I could basically from what I could tell. Um, so they they donated or they they um, were really in, influential uh, in the area with getting people to buy Liberty Bonds. Um, the only time where I could find a, a concrete number of how much money they um, put into Liberty Bonds uh, was in the fourth Liberty Loan Drive where they bought $100 worth of bonds. Um, but going back to the Federal Reserve's recruitment of women, there were two main members of the Women's Club of Bala Kenwood, uh, which had active roles in organizing Liberty Bonds in the area. And those were Mrs. Grigg and Mrs. Snyder. Uh, on the right, uh, one of the meeting entries reads that the local women's campaign for the second and third Liberty Loans were successfully managed by our two club members, Mrs. Grigg and Mrs. Snyder. So the club was really influential in getting the community um, together uh, to help finance the war. In this case, it's important to remember that women not only made material contributions to the war effort, uh, such as surgical, the surgical dressings that I mentioned earlier, um, but also played a significant role in providing financial capital for the war. So um, while most of what I talked about uh, in the past, the previous slides has been what the Women's Club of Balakinwood did on the home front, uh, there was also a need for in-person overseas aid. Um, one of the notable members who volunteered her time and skills overseas was a Mrs. Dorothea Fox. She spent um, some months abroad in France to volunteer in the war um, in 1917. She actually went to France twice. So she went, uh, spent some time in France for a couple months, came back and then went back again. So she went twice to France. The only primary information that I could find about her service was just information about when she left and returned. So that's how I know she went twice. Um, but after spending time abroad the first time, she came back um, and continued to advocate for the importance of war work and aiding uh, those affected by the war. So when she came back the second time, she gathered donations from the club members to bring back with her to France. So the um, excerpt on the right reads how Mrs. Fox stepped down from her positions. Um, and the excerpt reads, Mrs. Hamilton read a letter from Mrs. Walter Fox resigning from the vice presidency, executive board, and as chairman of the social service department and asked the prayers of the members that she might be of use somewhere in France. Now, this is one aspect of the project which I wish I could have explored uh, further is namely what did she do while she was abroad? Um, it's very vague, somewhere in France, but um, I wish I could have figured out where she went, what she did, and uh, specifically, but that information I was not able to find. I think the only way to find that information most likely would have been through letters that I didn't have access to or family members. Um, so I can only assume that she volunteered with the Red Cross or the YWCA, but I don't know. Um, but if we think about female volunteers in a larger sense, um, it's interesting to discuss the demographics of these women um, and what organizations such as the Red Cross were looking for in volunteers. So the two main qualifications for becoming an overseas volunteer was to become was to be relatively affluent and mostly independent. So in the case of Dorothea Fox, uh, she fit the qualifications perfectly. She would have had enough money to support herself while abroad, and she also had little family obligations uh, other than her husband in this case. Um, so when she left, uh, she most likely would have been without children uh, because I found her name. The, the way I found her name was going through the census. Um, so I found the 1920 census and on the 1920 census, she had two children, but they were both between the ages of one and two. So if you do the math, um, she most likely would not have had children in 1917, 1918. Um, so she would have been able to go abroad without, you know, major difficulty. Um, and in general, the Red Cross was looking for educated women in their mid twenties who spoke either French or Italian. Um, also, by going through the census, I was able to find out that she would have been around the age of 28 to 30 um, when she went abroad. So she would have been a perfect candidate for an overseas volunteer. Um, so an author who wrote about uh, Red Cross volunteers, Nancy O'Brien Wagner, um, her quotes on this slide here, and it says that these restrictions largely limited the volunteer pool to unmarried, educated, upper class women, those without spousal obliga obligations or significant financial needs. And this does not in, in any way diminish the work accomplished by these women uh, that were able to go abroad, but it does put into perspective uh, the role that ac uh, economic status has and one's willingness and ability 
uh, to support a war abroad. Um, so the financial positions of certain women in the club uh, made it possible for them to spend a large amount of their time and money de uh, devoted wholeheartedly to the war effort. So this is my last slide here, um, but I think one of the larger themes that we can take out um, of this presentation and the work of the Women's Club of Ballad Kenwood as a whole during this time is that there's an interconnected nature between social movements and the war, in this case, World War I. Um, the war did not happen in a vacuum, right? There were social and political issues happening simultaneously with the war that cannot be separated from the war's history. So if we think about the YWCA, while they were su supplying those abroad, simultaneously, they were reckoning and restructuring their own organization to be more um, inclusive of the volunteers that they had. Um, the nation as a, as a whole was embroiled in a war in Europe, but also at home had to deal with uh, women demanding equal treatment um, in terms of voting rights and other rights. And those are just two examples, um, but it shows how war and social movements tend to happen together and can't really be separated. Um, so though the actions of the Women's Club of Alcan would show how social um, issues and World War I um, were intertwined. During World War I, um, the Women's Club of Alcan would covered many social issues like I said, such as safeguarding children. And you can see that with their sponsoring of children abroad, um, integration of refugees and immigrants. And you can see that with their support of the YWCA Americanization efforts um, and also legislative advocacy. Um, they advocated for the, the PA state um, legislature uh, for increased child labor laws and also the national Congress um, about child labor laws and housing laws. Needless to say, overall, the club was an active org organization that did truly strive for change and progress. Um, I think that one of the best excerpts that fully encompasses the early years of the Women's Club of Alec Kenwood um, comes from the fifth president of the club, uh, Mrs. Bean. And the quote reads, our president, Mrs. Bean, eloquently brought before us the convention's plea for the Women's Club to recognize that patriotic service consists not alone in war work, but also in attention to the many attending civic and economic problems, such as the child labor law, the alien and his education, equal suffrage, the perplexing Negro question, et cetera. These stories from the Women's Club of Alec Kenwood uh, show concrete examples of national social trends of the 20th century um, and bring them to a local level. Uh, these narratives show how local stories can connect individuals to the uh, larger national shared um, history. So thank you for listening. This concludes my presentation. I hope you were able to learn something new about uh, women in Lower Marion history. Um, I hope I didn't speak too fast. I'm gonna turn on a light um, and I think we're going to move on to questions now. Give me one sec, yeah. Go ahead, Bria. And thank you so much for this presentation and the depth and breadth of what you covered in one summer looking at the records of this organization. It's really uh, remarkable. So I congratulate you and I'm I'm so pleased that um that you were able to do this with us this summer. So we'll now take some time to move into the question and answer and discussion portion of our webinar. I'll be sifting through the questions that came in prior to the webinar and the ones that I've seen so far during the webinar, they're excellent. Um, and I'm pleased to say that for this discussion, we will be joined by two members of the Women's Club currently. So we have uh the president, Stephanie Gambija Seal and longtime member Marge Dawson. And I'll make sure Marge is able to speak if there's any questions that have to do with um, the more recent years of the club. So before we launch into some participant questions, I had a few that I wanted to ask um, based on our work together. And so the first one, Bria, is to ask you to reflect on this evidence that you collected through the archives and all the other sources that you use to contextualize the evidence and to ask you what you think its value is. What is the value of this evidence to us today and to future generations? Um, so I think I have a couple of responses to this. And the first one that came to the top of my head is like a larger idea of just we need to be more aware as a nation how war affects not only those fighting abroad, but also those on the home front um, and what the responsibility of those at, at home at, in the U.S. have to understanding um, how wars affect the, the global um, political um, atmosphere. Um, 
another thing in terms of the women, I think that just as the way that we write history in the U.S., I think that we just have completely ignored the the important role that women have played in, you know, um, supplying uh, resources for, you know, American wars. And they have always been there. Like, you can find stories from the American Revolution, um, World War One, obviously, World War Two. Um, and usually when you, you hear those stories, you don't hear about the women. And I think that there needs to be more emphasis on the role of the home front um, in American history. That's great. Thank you, Bria, for those reflections. Um, the second question I have actually overlaps with one that just came in from Hillary Kativa that I will read. And her question is, thank you, Bria, for this wonderful presentation. I loved all the rich details. You mentioned using the census to learn more about Miss Dorothea Fox. What other resources did you use to supplement your research with Bella Kinwood records? And, and my question similarly was, you know, how did you, what was your process for understanding the context of what you were reading um, in these archives? You know, what other resources did you use? And could you highlight a few to help us understand how this can help further public understanding of history like this? Yeah. Um, so usually this is different from many other like research papers that I've done, because usually I start with a, a large, broad idea, and then I narrow it down to something very specific. Here, I was doing something completely different. I had you know, pages that would mention something that I it would be very vague and I would say, well, what does this mean? And so I had to do like opposite research than I'm used to, I guess. Um, so a lot of my research that I did focused on the broad trends, like I mentioned throughout the presentation, like the broad social trends. And then I would try and connect different um, excerpts that I found into those social trends and say, well, maybe this is what they were referencing. And maybe this is a way that the women's club uh, supported this, uh, you know, social issue or this um economic issue um so doing like i guess reverse research um in my case uh, is something that i did a lot um a lot of the the resources that i used were mainly academic journals um i also used a lot that um, red cross report from 1919 um that was really useful because it was just a report from the from the red cross from 1919 that just gave pure numbers and so it was easy to compare okay well they donated 2,000 surgical dressings a month. How much really was that, you know? I mean, it was a lot, of course, but when you're thinking of like 300 to 6 million, that's, you know, it's a substantial um, uh, contribution that a lot of people were making um, throughout World War One. That's great, thank you so much. Um, I'll turn to a question from Jason Goodman. Um, and his question, I think, relates to his position on the Neighborhood Club of Valley Kinwood Board. But he was asking, was there any discussion about the relationship of the Women's Club of Valley Kinwood with the Neighborhood Club of Valley Kinwood during this era um, in your archives? And I'll mention, so the Neighborhood Club of Valley Kinwood predates the Women's Club by several years. I think it was 1906. Um, and since there were no women in the Neighborhood Club of Valley Kinwood, the creation of the Women's Club of Bella Kinwood was, was one opportunity for women to have this civic organization. So I'm curious if you came across references to the Neighborhood Club in the archives you were looking at. Yeah, there were a couple of times. Um, so sometimes they used um, the, 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 um, the um, like clubhouse for the for the neighborhood club um so sometimes they would hold their meetings there but then sometimes they would have if they were doing something that was like legis legislative sometimes they would have um a member of the neighborhood club uh help support them in writing a letter so they would write a letter then have it like co-signed by you know the the neighborhood club so there were mentions um i'm sure if you went back you could probably find names because they, they would list names the problem is i just didn't know like who they were affiliated with so there'd be a mr somebody from you know, this place and he came in to talk about something um, or he came in to help uh, organize this event. Um, so there probably are references, more references in the records. Uh, you just have to look through them. Great. Uh, there's two other questions that relate to situating this club in context of other clubs doing other mm -hmm. things locally and regionally and nationally and all those things. Um, and so question from Jason again on the relationships with other area women's clubs and from Georgette about other women's clubs around the country, how, when, and why did that movement get started? And that's a, a much broader question, but it's very much of interest. We recently 
had a talk that was hosted by the Bella Kimwood Library about this topic in relation to garden clubs and horticulture and women's clubs that were were working in those spheres. Um, and it's it's interesting. It's an interesting history that looks at all the different areas that women were active in and, and why this was happening at this particular time and how these women uh, women's clubs were integrating with each other. So, for example, the Women's Club of Bella Kinwood was integrated at the state level with the State Federation of Club Women and at the county level. So Montgomery County had its organizations of women's clubs. And it's really interesting when I was looking at the records to look at how how this was organized, how well integrated it was, how, you know, the, the state would host conventions and women's clubs would come, right? And women's clubs would host each other's members and, and share information and, and women getting together for, to organize was the theme there. So I wondered if you had anything to add about links you saw with other women's clubs. I mean, I think you summarized it perfectly. I was going to mention that there were a lot of conventions that the, the officers of the women's club would go to at the state level. They would come back, bring ideas that they learned there and share them with the local community. So there is a like a web of women sharing ideas throughout the nation. Um, and it, you can see it at the county level, like you mentioned, also the state and then national level. So it was it was a, a national, but also uh, in neighborhood movement. That's great. Thank you. And Ted Goldsboro has something to add with some context about Dorothea Fox. She lived at 31 Narbrook Park in Narberth. Um, so a Narberth connection uh, related to the research that you did and the findings that you had. Thanks for that, Ted. Um, let's see, one other question. So let's let's go back to the, in particular, the sponsorship of the Romanian children and the mm -hmm. French children. So Janet was wondering more details about what that sponsorship looked like. So they weren't they weren't bringing the children here, right? But they were providing funds so that to support these children. Could you give us some more information about what that looked like? Yeah, um, there really wasn't that much more information um, about the sponsorship. They mentioned that they sponsored some children, um, the two children. They mentioned, you know, how the club split the the sponsorship between the daughters and the mothers. Um, they mentioned how they sent funds, basically, but nothing really passed that. Um, so. I wish I could have found more. They also, in terms of, they also um, funded, there was something called the Belgian Children's Fund. Um, so that was something else that they funded, um, but they were making sure that they were sending um, resources abroad for the children. Great, one question here from Mo, which was asking, I understand that there was also a mainline business and professional women's club, BPW is the acronym, around the same time. Any archival information on that group? And I'll share, that's the first I'm hearing about it and I'm very intrigued. Um, and one thing I'll mention is a lot of this information exists in archives that people might not know about and, and that may be in basements or in filing cabinets or other locations, um, you know, that are, are not known to the public. They're not accessible for researchers. And it's the kind of thing that the historical society is very interested in preserving these records and making them accessible. Um, another example are the archives of the Marian Civic Association. We recently became aware that those are at the Marian Tribute House and are also a treasure trove of information about what was happening with that civic. Um, and so it's, it's a really interesting resource base for us to leverage, to ask questions about history at this time. And so I would say, Mo, I would love if you could reach out to us at the Lower Marion Historical Society and provide more information um, because the existence of that group means there's probably some more information out there that we could leverage and, and try to figure out how it intersects with this club. So Bria, did anything come up with a group like this in your research? No, I don't remember seeing anything like that. Um... Maybe it had a different name at one point, but I don't I don't remember anything like a business club for women, but I'm sure it was there. <laughs> Great. And I wanted to give Stephanie and Marge a chance to speak up if they want, um, given their long association with the club and its more recent years, um, how you might reflect on this work and I know about 10 years ago, there was the centennial of the club, which is another kind of celebration of this history. Um, so if you had anything to add, I wanted to give you a chance to do so now. 
I, I'm Marge, and I would very much like to thank you for doing this. It's a, it's always been a dream of of mine to get keep the club going, and hope it can be um, a, a part of the community and sponsoring Red Cross blood drives were always special. I know with the um, old president, Fran Bruner, anytime the Red Cross said boo, we hopped. And um, we always supported the blood drives. And apparently the blood drive people like to come to the uh, Balakinwood um, ballroom because it was such a lovely ballroom and they could go over and have Jaime sandwiches for lunch. So um, uh, it, I, I just appreciate you all doing this. I know I saw those big trunks many times with their treasures and uh, I'm just so delighted that uh, you've put it in order and it's being preserved. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for being here. It was such a good, like a, it's such an interesting and also eye-opening experience going through these records. I learned so much about um, just the Women's Club in general, but women in Lower Marion. Um, and like you said, like the Red Cross, the amount of work that the women uh, during World War I um, put into the Red Cross every month, donating, um, spending a lot of time uh, putting their um, efforts into the Red Cross organization. Um, so. And I, I don't know where Marcy is, but Marcy, May, Marcy gave tons of, of uh, love and work and scrubbing to that club. I can't tell you. She was a real uh, leader and asset to the club. Thank you, Marcy. Thanks, Marge. One thing that struck me with these records were these women who gave so much time and consistently pushed the club forward. And it's like throughout the era of all the archives, it's like names emerge right and they and and it's you see those same names over and over and over again and so you know the recent leadership with Marcy and Marge and Stephanie um you know that's that's the latest iteration i think of of the really inspiring leadership that we we've seen from this club for it's 110 plus years mm -hmm. um and i'll also say it's also really interesting to think about the resonance of the the red cross right kind of with that early activism and then all the way through today, all those folks who were giving blood as part of your drives, you know, are continuing that tradition of service and civic action throughout the community. So it's, re it's really nice. Thank you so much, Marge, for, for sharing that. And Stephanie, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, sure. Uh, so on the note of the Red Cross and the continuing support, we have people who are in the hundreds, two hundreds, uh, that we, we can see how many times someone has donated and it really is the same folks coming back uh, season after season every summer and winter to donate. So it is really cool to see the same names pop up, the same support uh, and people who you, you don't know who you know, kind of, um, that you are connected with people who have done really great things in the community, um, who have started the first library and who have made such a difference for so many of us. And you might know their relatives or might live down the street from them and you never knew it until you get involved with the club. It's really a, a hidden gem and we're lucky to be part of it. So thank you so much for doing this presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, well, Stephanie. Uh, Go ahead, Bria. Uh, no, 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 I spoke over you, but I just wanna say thank you for being here. Um, adding your your insights because you have so much more uh, historical knowledge about the club than I do. It's great. Thank you so much for sharing that those reflections and for your leadership, Stephanie and Marge. Um, one thing I want to say before I, I head into our wrap up is you might wonder what is in store for these archives um, that Bria reviewed and we had at least four to five high school students who are also doing similar looks, you know, at different slices of time. And, you know, that research is kind of ongoing. And so these records are um, very important. And um, at the Historical Society, we are working to figure out how to preserve them, make them accessible. Um, so it's something where stay tuned. 
for news from the Historical Society about um, these records, especially if they're of interest to you for research or just to see um, some of the material that Bria shared today. Um, you know, we're very committed to making sure that this important history in our community is accessible to everyone. So with that, I will move to wrap us up for the night and thank Bria again for your presentation and your inspiring and very dedicated work with us this summer. It was an absolute pleasure on behalf of the whole board to work with you. And we're so delighted that uh, the internship worked out. I also wanna thank everyone who joined us tonight. I wanna say on behalf of the society, we invite you to join our public visitation hours. These are Wednesday evenings at the Lower Marion Academy building. This is the oldest school building in our county. It was built in 1812 on a large estate that later became home to both the Kinwood Elementary School and the Bala Kinwood Middle School. This is on Bryn Mawr Ave in Bala Kinwood. We have an outstanding local and regional history collection and our newest item will be a printed version of Bria's research paper. You will be able to find that at the Society this week. If you come, wait, tonight, tomorrow, if you come on Wednesday to our open hours, we'll make sure that it's available if you want to take a look. Our website is also an excellent resource for information about the history of the people and the places in our community. And you can always research, research, reach us at info at lowermarionhistory.org and on Facebook and Instagram. So I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We hope to see you soon at the Society or at a future program. Good night, everyone.